Hello everyone, this is Hector Valenzuela presenting a recent case of preperitoneal ETEP for a patient with ventral and inguinal hernia. This is the way I position the patient, looking at it from the side, you can see that the legs are bent to the back so they can be out of your hands way. This is how open I keep the legs, just to stand in between them. For the first part of the surgery, this is the port placement. We start with a suprapubic port. We're going to dissect zone one, and this dissection takes place after placing a 12 millimeter port, and it's done uh, through a, a telescopic uh, dissection. Afterwards, we place the ports in, and we stay in the preperitoneal space behind the posterior rectus sheath, and we're going to keep dissecting on top of the median umbilical ligament until we make the progression from the median umbilical ligament to the falciform ligament. On the left, you can see the way the ports are placed and how we're working. If you see the ports on the working arms are a little higher, so you don't collide so much with the legs. And afterwards, uh, this is a voluminous hernia sac, so I made an incision to widen a little bit the hernia defect and reduce the contents back into the extraperitoneal cavity along with the hernia sac. Uh, we were able to preserve it all and continue the dissection superficial to the falciform ligament until we see that the diastasis becomes more narrow. Um, you see there zone two of dissection and now, the next, the next task will be to dissect what Miguel Ángel García Ureña and Javier López Monclus in the Madrid modification to TAR describe as the area of desert, which is where the peritoneum is very thin. So to dissect this area, if we try to go from medial to lateral, we are going to most likely open the peritoneum because it's very thin. So what I prefer to do is go lateral and get into the pretransversalis space and dissect the transversalis fascia lateral where it hasn't fused so densely to the other contributions of the posterior rectus sheath to the midline and do the dissection from lateral to medial, uh, being able to preserve a more uh, solid uh, superficial posterior layer. You can see there the difference between the pretransversalis space and the preperitoneal space as if we were looking at the parietal compartment and the visceral compartment in inguinal hernia surgery. We're going to do the same thing on the right side, and you can notice that most of this dissection is left 100% unedited. So uh, you can see that it actually doesn't take a very long time once you have figured out how to get into the correct plane. It's mostly blunt dissection because there aren't any big blood vessels in this area. And it's just a matter of doing traction, contra-traction, being patient and allowing the CO2 to help you do part of the dissection. In the end of the screen, you see the transversus abdominus muscle. That's a good reference that you have reached the correct area because we uh, usually don't go beyond the TA for uh, dissecting for this smaller kind of hernias with diastasis. You see there a good example of traction and contra-traction. Again, this hasn't been edited. You can see the, the full dissection in this area, and you can see how thin and frail the peritoneum is in the area where the transversalis fascia joins the midline. But if you go from the transversalis fascia to the preperitoneal space, it's a lot easier to do. Finally, you can see the hernia defect. You can see the diastasis. And through this hernia defect, we're going to place a 12 millimeter port and we're going to insert the vision through this port and now we're going to look downwards into the inguinal areas. Our left hand becomes the right hand, right hand becomes the left hand and we do an ETEP for the inguinal hernias. This patient had two uh, rather small uh, direct hernias and big cord lipomas in both inguinal areas. So uh, right now we're dissecting in the parietal compartment superficial to the uh, layer in the bladder where the autonomic nerves are, so uh, the patient doesn't have foreign body sensation with the mesh. We see the vas deferens on the right side and dissect away the peritoneum. 
creating a nice retroperitoneal flap for the mesh overlap. Now we progress into the visceral compartment, reduce the cord lipoma, and now we're gonna do the same thing on the right side. In this side, I left unedited this part where you can see the transversalis fascia inserting on the lateral edge of the rectus. We're cutting the transversalis fascia, which will be called the intermediate fascia in this, in this part of the surgery, migrating now into the visceral compartment. And our focus at this time is to stay very close to the peritoneum, so all the fat protecting the nerves on the left side of the screen will be uh, left in its rightful place without uh, injuring or, or keeping away, uh, out of harm's way, the nerves. This is a heavyweight polypropylene mesh, self-cut. Uh, we put both uh, meshes on both sides. And because we're gonna go back and we're gonna work on the pelvis, I prefer to uh, make a little bit of fixation so the mesh isn't uh, shifted out of its uh, rightful position while we work on the ventral part of the abdomen. Because we don't want to injure the midline uh, with trockers after having closed it, it's that I prefer to do first the dissection in the ventral area and then the dissection for the inguinal area, mesh placement, and then go back to close the, the ventral hernias. Here we have a very nice overlap of the meshes. They look quite symmetrical, both reinforcing uh, adequately the myopectineal orifice in both sides. And by placing these very loose vicral stitches, I am uh, almost certain that the mesh is not going to shift or change when we are doing the rest of the surgery for the ventral hernia. So back in between patient's legs, we're now looking uh, towards the patient head. Uh, we are imbricating the diastasis with the inan inverting plication. We are using a number one V-lock. And this stitch allows me to bring into the extra peritoneal space the excess fascia instead of making it go into the subcutaneous space, which will uh, make the patient feel a rich. Once I placated the fascia, I'm gonna close the normal fashion, the hernia defect. Uh, when I have the defect like this, I prefer not to run the suture uh, to shut it close. I prefer to keep the defect open so I can throw uh, stitches uh, close to each other and make sure that there's enough suture for the length of defect that I want to close, trying to preserve the four to one ratio recommended by the experts. We're close to being done here. I uh, usually run the suture a little further from the defect, then uh, secure it tightly. Uh, I do this a couple times, so the tension along the defect is well distributed and the suture is less likely to break or become uh, injured by my manipulation. And then I'm gonna run the suture back through the line uh, which, it, which I came from just to reinforce a little more. And finally, extract the needle out of the extraperitoneal cavity. You can see there the closure. And finally, placing a heavyweight macroporous polypropylene mesh covering the space that we dissected, removing the CO2 from the cavity. And that's it. This procedure took approximately uh, an hour and a half. And this is the looks of the patient after the surgery took place. Thank you very much.